I always had a passion for death metal and extreme metal. And that's what I had to work with at the time was envelopes, stamps, a pen, <laughs> underground broken hope flyers and demo tapes that I would dub at home, you know? So that's how we did it. And that's really honest to God how we built the band up, or at least I did by hand, like really old school. Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, this is Jeremy Wagner from Earthburner and also from a band called Broken Hope. And Jeremy, would it be fair to say that through your work with Broken Hope, the style of music that you're most associated with is death metal? Yeah, absolutely. Death metal, old school death metal for a long time with Broken Hope. Earthburner, a bit more on the grindcore side with some death metal elements you could call it grind horror or death grind but death metal seems to be a part of everything i do musically so the era of death metal that you belong to has become extremely popular in recent years <laughs> almost revered and we've got a lot of these kind of old school revival bands would you mind telling me what what it was like in in the old days and, and how you discovered this music were you a tape trader? Oh, yeah. Were you reading zines and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. Like, like I'll tell you, Adrian, like I've been telling a number of journalists and interviewers lately, I sound like old man Wagner when I say this, but when I was a teenager and form Broken Hope, like that was in, in high school, 1988, and we did our first couple of demo tapes, so I was really into tr tape trading, demo tapes, and if anyone listening to your show 
no is it immolation who's like immolation suffocation cannibal corpse broken hope we all came out formed and you know came out as bands in 1988 and immolation especially ross stolen was a huge help to me and broken hope because they really got around with their demo tape they had one out before us and they they well specifically ross i should say of immolation had given me a list of all these fanzines that reviewed demos and he said send the send your demo to all these zines here's the addresses and tell them i sent you and blah 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 and our demos started getting reviewed all over the world in the underground in these handmade do-it-yourself fanzines and from there that you know we just got a bigger and bigger underground reputation and then right when we got signed and released our first album swamp and roar in 1991 so many people had known about us just from the underground i think we sold like 10,000 copies of that album in the first month or something and that was pretty good for back then and then you know we were we we're on metal blade records and i was still even in the early days having those first couple albums out i was still actively promoting the band in the underground you know we had a po box people sent letters to our fan club i still remember it too po box 445 gurney illinois and we i'd always go in there and there'd be mail from all over the world especially after we got signed you know our metal blade had worldwide distribution and so people were picking our albums up in stores and, and i used to personally answer all the e art so email the old mail the old school handwritten letters i would write back to fans and stuff so that was like it's like a different world now you know when i talk about it and look back it's like people don't have you know fan club addresses people have emails and social media and that's how they promote their band but back then it was all do it yourself and i was just hell-bent on everyone knowing who broken hope was i always had a passion for death metal and extreme metal and that's what i had to work with at the time was envelopes stamps a pen <laughs> underground broken hope flyers and demo tapes that i would dub at home you know so that's how we did it that's really honest to god how we built the band up or at least i did by hand like really old school that's that's what we had no computers nothing you know no social media so yeah it's kind of cool looking back going down memory lane thinking about how we did it back then and what how how bands it's a lot easier for bands to promote themselves now but that's how we did it back then yeah i'm curious why why death metal what what brought you into the music and and why is why is this the thing that you ended up spending so much of your life uh, performing writing being involved with well i have very eclectic tastes i could tell you that like as a fan so i love the bgs Duran Duran, <laughs> 70s era Skinner, it's my favorite band of all time. But there's something about metal that really got a hold of me in a big way. And when I was just getting into junior high, I would have been in seventh grade, I was starting to get into hard rock and metal. And so you're talking like, Screaming for Vengeance by Judas Priest came out and bands like Crocus and, and whatnot were coming out. And, you know, I, they, I, I wasn't like a Kiss fan at all. I was into these other bands I thought had more of an edge and more guitar driven stuff. I was really into guitar, like, you know, before I became a guitar, guitar player and, and, and I just sought out more and more metal and it wasn't, it was like 1984 rolled around and I like had heard of Metallica, Kill Em All and I'd see them in record store bins and Slayer too and other bands, but oh, and Armored Saint, that was a band I really liked their first album, but 
1984, I guess I heard Ride the Lightning. And that album, above all albums that I'd heard before that, as my metal, my love of metal grew and grew, and I wanted to hear harder and heavier stuff, that album changed my life. That's the moment, Adrian, I'm like, wow, I want to do that. I want to be a metal guitar player. And that's when I got, right around the time I got my first electric guitar. And and then it was just wanting to hear heavier and heavier music. And then, you know, 86 rolls around. Well, 85, Hell Awakes comes out. 86, Rain and Blood, Master of Puppets. And I discover Celtic Frost. And then, boom, after that, it's like Dark Angel, Darkness Descends, and Death, Scream Bloody Gore, and man, it just kept going. And then from there, Death turned into, you know, this is my path, I'm, if you follow me. I'm like, I discover Morbid Angel, Carcass, Terrorizer, Obituary, Slowly We Rot, on and on and on. And I'm like, man... There and then when it got to that point, I'm like, to this day, I'm like, shit. There's nothing heavier. There's nothing heavier than death metal. Sure, everyone's got an opinion about what heavy is. You know, someone could say a doom sludge band is the heaviest genre or whatever. But for me, for me personally, death metal is the epitome of my brand of the heaviest music that was my journey to to get the heaviest band you know like i wanted to hear the heaviest bands and i wanted to play the heaviest music and that's why death metal looking back since i was in my late teens till now i'm 54 years old old man wagner i still have a huge passion for death metal and grindcore and it's just, it's it's just everything to me. So, I don't know if that backstory history of my journey from metal to seeking out the heaviest, heaviest, heaviest music makes any sense. But that's the best way I can explain it, and it it's it's just part of my DNA to this day. You know, just listen to that new Earthburner album. You know, I wrote that, recorded that just last year, and. I'm, I'm not stopping, bro. You know, I'm like, still, still loving it. Still love playing it and listening to it in extreme metal. Again, my tastes personally are eclectic, but in a band, what I like to play and do is just write and play, you know, relentless, ferocious, super heavy death metal and grind. And we'll we'll speak uh, more about Earthburner in a little bit. I am curious though. As as a songwriter, how how have things changed from you for you from when you were writing the original Broken Hope songs in high school to now? Were you demoing stuff on a, a four track back then? We always recorded in professional studios from the get go. Now I would write riffs at home on like a basically a boombox, mostly boombox, or I did have like a four or an eight track at one point. So I could do multi-track stuff for harmonies. And I found that Broken Hope's music since Swamp the Gore over the course of time with several studio albums just was one part growth musicianship-wise for the guys and me. And while still retaining that ultra brutality and and not compromising musically or lyrically with that the extreme side but on the musician side we 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 got better at our instruments so i say it'd be like there's just a growth in you know how proficient we were at our instruments we got better and better but we still kept it sick as they say you know so if you listen to swamp the gore from 1991 and every album in between up till Beatle Lay assimilated in 2017, you you I think any listener would would agree that you hear that growth 
whether it's, you know, technical playing harmonies, leads to song structures, you got all that, but then you still have just sheer, you know, out for blood, pummeling, sheer brutality. You know, that's always been part of the part of the mission. So other than that, you know, I write all the lyrics for the band. I would say that my lyric writing always got better and better. Just like I write books full time. I'm a published author. So writing is a full time job and I always loved it. But I got better as a lyricist, I think. But with that's not the content wise, though, is always that that's open for interpretation because <laughs> the subject matter always leaves something to be desired. But you take take the music and the lyrics for what they are. There's all I can say is there's definitely been an evolution, but we're still I like to think we're still on brand, if you know what I mean. Yeah. With Earthburner and the most recent Broken Hope stuff, have you been using a DAW like Pro Tools or something like that to to help with your songwriting or to demo music? Yep. That's what I, I use at home. I've got Pro Tools in my home studio and that's primarily what I use to write and record on so i've got there's uh well actually we just released this is relevant to broken hope and earth burner today our our like publicity team behind the earth burner album released a rig rundown of mine so i'm like showing what i record with and on and you get a peek inside my studio and so i've got a lot of gear and I'll try some different tones and, and, and stuff. But I'm always seeking the heaviest tone possible for a guitar. But the great thing uh, about having a home studio Pro Tools is I write Broken Hope and Earthburner stuff there. And I can easily, you know, add, you know, like four guitar tracks, some different ideas. If I got leads or harmonies and whatnot. But another thing that's great about it is. I write stuff that's not even like broken hope stuff. I'm talking like shoegazy cinematic, like movie score, dark horror sounding stuff too. Like I have a guitar synth and a bunch of different things I like to experiment with. But that said, to answer your question is yeah, pro tools. That's all I use now at home just to, just to demo with. I I don't like record our al- albums here or anything. I don't got that much room, but um, I can I definitely write a lot of stuff for the my other pans, you know, and experiment. Is the cinematic stuff something that you're in- interested in doing? Do you want to do film scores and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I've been interested in doing that for a while. I've got a I have a production company. We actually have two documentary films that I think might be coming out next year so i did music for not the full score i did some music for for those and there's a couple other film projects that i want to score to so it's definitely something i'm interested in doing more of i really like that stuff that's great when you're writing music for earthburner and broken hope how finished are the demos by the time the rest of the band hears them do you do like pre-pro pre-pro drums and stuff like that a lot's ch- changed in that regard, and probably in the last decade. I would say if you went back to 2014, like, or 2013, say, the, the a Broken Hope album that, that year is called Omen of Disease. Up to that point, I always, I'm talking like back when Broken Hope started, I would write mostly a, the, a whole song on guitar from start to finish and then bring it into the band and go here, here's a song I wrote, you know, and I work with our drummer first and get it and then bring in the other guys. And that's kind of like how I always wrote. And then things started changing right around 2014, 2015. I started writing more riffs on the spot like with my drummer so like say we're rehearsing and to do a show or a tour i start writing riffs more spontaneously and having the drummer jump in and we're instantly collaborating so 
that that's been a more and more of a common theme in the in the music writing but you know that well and that's specific to broken hope with earth burner i guess the same thing it, it's worth mentioning the same thing i wrote all those earth burner songs to actual like it wasn't it wasn't quite it wasn't a drum machine it was more like a click track or even sometimes like you know like super kind of blasty drum loop kind of things back in the day when i f first wanted to do broken open 2002 so i was doing that and then with again kind of like broken hope after 2014 i had old stuff i was sitting on and then new new material that we actually wrote one song right in the studio on the spot so again the the, the songwriting or at least my idea of songwriting has been more collaboration than it is solitary if you know what i mean yeah absolutely you to put Earthburner together? What were your goals at the time? I wanted to do a, a real straight up like tribute of my own to one of my favorite albums of all time, which is Terrorizer World Downfall that came out in 1989. That level of grindcore I had never heard before. I mean, I love Napalm Death. They're one of my favorite bands, but there's something about that World Downfall album by terrorizer that to this day had such a profound effect on me that I'm like, I want to like capture that intensity. I, you know, I, you just heard me go on about how I was on the quest, like Lord of the Rings for the greatest, heaviest riff of all time. I'm always on that quest, but I'd never done anything super extreme, like a grind band, like terrorizer, and again, specifically World Downfall. That's my main inspiration for Earthburner. So 2001, 2002, Broken Hope was going on hiatus, and I wasn't going to waste any time. And I, I'm like, I'm going to do a grind band. I don't want to do a new, different version of Broken Hope. And Earthburner was the name of a Broken Hope song off our fifth album, Grotesque Blessings. It was two words, Earth Burner, two separate words. And I'm like... I'll make a band called Earthburner, one word. It'll be a grind band and pure terrorizer, world of downfall worship. <laughs> and that's kind of how it started. You know, I had, I, I really wanted to do something really extreme, super heavy, you know, and, but just sort of like celebrate more of the, the grindcore side of my 
life, my, what I'm passionate about. And, and, and weave in some death metal elements, you know? So I think I pulled that off and then, but earth burner kept getting put to the side, put to the side years went by. I'd still write riffs and stuff, but never had a full lineup. And then 2011 kind of got a start. We did a three song EP for earth burner and a video. And then 2012 comes along and broken hope reforms and i've been doing that ever since and uh earth burner i liken it to like this girl that i always had a crush on but i've been married and suddenly i got a chance to be with this other girl now that's kind of like what happened with earth burner the earth burner came back in my life last year and i'm like let's do it i have a full lineup and it, it just happened like or one part organically, like one part out of the blue and right place for right time. You know, the lineup is like a dream lineup for me. So uh, if hopefully I answer your question on why and how, I mean, it, Adrian, this is a like Earthburn has been a long time in the making, as you can see, you know, the seed was planted in 2001 and we finally are here with our first album. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you find writing grindcore is, is easier than writing death metal? It seems like it's it's trick here in a way. Yeah, it's like in some regards there there's not much of a difference. I mean I gotta be any time any riff I write for either of the two bands, I gotta be inspired. And I'm usually inspired by screwing around through my guitar rig. And, and have a really heavy tone that I'm absolutely crazy about. And that I, I'm like, oh, that sounds sick. And I just start just, you know, spitballing riffs. I'm just screwing around and then something sticks and I'm like, bam, that's it. But, and that, so that's the approach with both bands, you know, they're if not, I don't find one is like trickier, then the other, I feel like there's certain songs between both bands where there's a little level of technicality, but Earthburner is more of, you got the, a very simple formula. It's like grinding blast beats, then you come in with a, I come in with a super heavy riff that could be considered death metal in style. And it, the whole point of that riff is to contrast the extreme grind and come out of nowhere with some kind of riff that just wants to cleave your head off right and then the song is done but the approach to the songwriting is either i'm inspired by my guitar tone and just come up with a heavy riff or back to that collaboration type of writing that i told you about more so with Earthburner, especially i'll tell mike our drummer like man I want, I got, I got a drum beat in my head and I want you to go like this on a, you know, snare, like a grinding thing. And I'll just come in and start doing off the, something off the top of my head. The mic's drumming that I'm kind of directing them to do. And boom, next thing I know, we got a song. And if you heard it, I don't know if you've heard our album yet, but anyone that hears the earth burner album, it's like compared to a broken hope album, it's way shorter, you know, broken hope albums are probably 40, 45 minutes sometimes i don't know something like that and earth burner is like i think under 28 minutes so and that's with like 10 or 11 tracks <clears throat> so we just go in and kill and again man it, I, it all circles back to real downfall terrorizer that's like what i wanted to capture like i, I to this day there's a lot of grind bands. There's a lot of grind albums that I like and whatnot, but I don't know. I just, I, I think that album's got to be the most extreme and over the top controlled drumming. Just the drumming alone is like same dude, Pete Sandoval, former angel drummer or OG, right? It's like what he did on that world downfall album that's what planted a seed in my head to go, holy cow, how how could I attain that? I can't really do that with Broken Hope, but 
maybe I could was something else. So it's really where what what inspired me. So yeah. So the first Earthburner album is called Permanent Dawn, and it will be released by M Theory Audio on the eighth of November. Jeremy, can you tell me who is on the roster for Permanent Dawn? Who are you working with on this album? All right, we've got Devin Swank on vocals. And for anyone who might not be familiar with Devin, he's in a band called Sanguisugabog, which is like the new wave of old school death metal bands that are really popular now. And then we've got Mike Michek from Broken Hope on drums. And then my stepson, Tyler, Tyler Afido on bass. Tyler also has his own grindcore band called Glory Hole Guillotine that he started back around 2017, I think. And then we also have some guest vocalists. So we have Ross Dolan of Immolation on one track. We've got a guy named Jake Cannavale. He's from a grindcore band out of Brooklyn called Vixen Maw. He's also... Jake's a really great actor. He's been in a bunch of movies and TV shows. And his father, Bobby Cannavale, is actually a famous Hollywood actor. But Jake, aside from acting, he loves his grindcore. He's got really sick vocals. So we had him guest appear along with Ross Dolan, like I mentioned. And then Mitch Harris, a Nate Palm Death, a longtime friend of mine. I always like Mitch's backup vocals on Nate Palm Death albums and live that high pitched screechy stuff. And yeah. I asked him if he'd come and do a guest vocal spot on a track. And he said, sure, send me all the songs and I'll, you know, pick one out to sing on. And when he came in the studio, I'm like, all right, what song are you going to do? He's like, oh, I got ideas for everyone. <laughs> so I'm like, well, guess what? We'll have you sing on the whole album. And he did. And so Mitch is kind of an honorary member. That's what I keep telling people. He's an honorary member of Earthburner. So that said, on Permanent Dawn, we got Mitch across the board and and this lineup. And for the next album, so like to, well, obviously the, the, the core, you know, Devin, Mike, Tyler, and me are already working on, right, you know, writing the next album already. But we got to have Mitch on board. He just brought a whole different level you know dynamics to vocally to to the album and just it's just a really cool surprise in in a way you know we weren't expecting to have like a dual vocal kind of thing going on but that's just how it happened so that's that's the lineup the core lineup and then some some guest vocals on on this album that's awesome you've been working on earthburner on and off since 2002 when did you have the songs for Permanent Dawn finished. When did you know you had an album ready to, to record? I had the, like, I had every song on that album written for a while before going into the studio. And there's a song called Broken Head. That's the oldest Earthburner song. I might be the, I, thinking back, I think that's the first song I ever wrote, Adrian, for the album. Like, I mean, for Earthburner, rather. But the one song I, I mentioned earlier in the interview that, you know, like the collaborating, spontaneously writing songs and riffs with our drummer, we and I we wrote a song in the studio. That song we wrote in the studio and recorded for Permanent Dawn is a track called Like Dogs. And I don't think I actually mentioned that to anyone yet in an interview. So you're the first one, actually. No one's asked about, like, the kind of like the history or heritage of, you know, Earthburner songs and whatnot. So I would say that maybe there's like 90, 98% of the stuff had been, had been around over the years from 2002 to 2011. And then the rest is like brand new. And, and, and then we have a cover song, the last track, Positive Outlook. That's actually a cover of a Corrosion of Conformity song from a album called Animosity. I think came out in 86. So we threw that on there. But everything else has actually been floating around in one way, shape, or form for a while. You know, like dogs, that's the newest. That was on the spot. So I got to ask, why COC and not Terrorizer? Well, 
that's a damn, you know what? That's a good question. No one ever asked me that. Why didn't you do a terrorizer cover? <laughs> I have thought doing a terrorizer cover, like fear of napalm for one, or need to live. I really like, I really love those songs. And, but that said, I just, for me, Remember when I told you about my evolution of listening to heavier and heavier bands as a teenager? Sure. Yeah. So, animosity, COC comes out. That's a different corrosion and conformity than what most people think of COC as, you know, the like kind of southern tinge, doomy kind of band. They the, That album was like so punk and thrashy and, and really badass. I, 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 I love that album so much to this day. And when I heard the song Positive Outlook, the reason I wanted to cover it is the, the reason I heard it the first time. There's a riff in the end of that song that is super heavy. And then that riff comes back slower. And you see that in a million death metal bands or other bands do do that now like that like you know playing a heavy song we even did in broken hope the song gore hog on swamp the gore has this heavy mid-paced groove riff totally slamming and then boom it's the same riff but slow down dun, 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 dun. you know that's like coc were doing that on positive outlook in 86 so that said that riff to me was so heavy and positive outlook. I always wanted to cover it in Broken Hope, man, like since we formed and we never did. We we did one cover, Broken Hope, that it was Captain Howdy by Twisted Sister. And then we did that on our third album, Repulsive Conception, because our singer Joe demanded that we do it. He <laughs> loved that song. And whatnot. So we were like, all right, we'll do it. And it was heavy, you know, we made it heavy. And so that same mindset was like, you know, if we ever did that song, Positive Outlook, especially through my guitar tone, that riff would be 100 times heavier. And I didn't get the opportunity to do it in Broken Oak. But Earthburner, we're going to the studio, doing Permanent Dawn. And I'm like, guys, listen to this song. I could play it. We could get this song down in a day. We Are you down? And I played it. Uh, played the song off the actual album that I played it through my guitar and they the guys were like holy shit that is really brutal let's do it so that's kind of how it happened you know you never know maybe we will do a terrorizer cover someday but that's coming right out of the box with the debut album we and as much as you hear me straight up telling you I, I worship World Downfall by Terrorizer I, you know being transparent, I'm admitting it. That's what made me, <laughs> you know, it just, it wasn't in the cards to cover a terrorizer song this time around, I guess. It was something else, but that's, that's kind of how that happened, you know.
So where did you end up recording the album? We recorded at a legendary studio called Criteria Recording Studios in Miami. And the reason for that is two things. One, I spent half the year in Miami Beach. So I'm from Chicagoland area. And that's where, you know, like people that know Broken Hope know like we're Chicago's death metal band, you know? So this is where I'm from, born and raised. But I always say I was born in the wrong climate because I do not like winter. I don't like ice and snow and cold weather. I, I, I like hot, sunny, tropical weather. So about eight years ago, my wife and I got a place in Miami Beach to escape the Chicago winters. And so we're there about six, seven months out of the year. And since I've lived down there, I've always known about Criteria Recording Studios. There are all these legendary albums recorded there. So several years ago, once we started doing the what we call the snowbird thing here in the States, when you flee winter, go south for the winter, from the north to the south, I'm like... I wanted to check out Criteria. I got an introduction to the guy who is the general manager, vice president named Trevor. We became really good friends. And I'll never forget, he gave me like the most epic tour of, of Criteria. And it's got like eight, eight rooms in it. But it all started as it's this huge complex now, but it all started as this one room like you know, box in, in Miami. But for its time, it was state of the art, like kind of like Abbey Road Studios in London, for example. You know, that's a legendary studio, right? And the the producer there who did all the, the Beatles albums and, and stuff, they had like a simple four track and you know whatever mics but microphones at the time were, were the best and everything. So same thing with criteria. It was this, you know, one room, a simple studio, and it was built for jazz bands. And there used to be a show called the Jackie Gleason Show that re- was recorded, like did audio stuff there and whatnot. And then, like, our, more and more artists started going there. And their first, like, gold single that was ever done there was James Brown, I Feel Good, you know, one of his biggest hits. And that was done on Criteria. Then over time, there's been a million bands that have recorded there. I mean, you know, from ABBA to the Bee Gees, Saturday Night Fever, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, Eagles Hotel California, Technical Ecstasy, My Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell by Black Sabbath, and heavier bands too. Obituary did an album there, and Six Feet Under recorded there. And then, you know, my my favorite band of all time, 70s era Skinner, they recorded there. So it has all this great musical history, which for me, I'm a real nut about music history and history in general and even oral histories, right? I really, I really like that kind of stuff. So that made the place special. But the the actual studio, like the rooms are amazing. They have like the best gear and, and set up and, and just my relationship with criteria and trevor i'm like if i'm ever gonna record whatever album i record or do next will be there and and when earth burner came together last year you know kind of happened out of the blue and it's almost like right time right place every, all the stars align and earth burners here and within a week i booked studio time because as i mentioned i've been sitting on earth burner material for a long time and my whole idea was i want to record at criteria because i want the best production and that place was going to give me everything i needed so if you i don't know what you know adrian about like recording gear but like the studio we recorded in had this great drum room and a, a neve board and we wanted the track on the neve board and use this drum room. It was Studio C. And that that studio, again, some of the history I rattled off, that's like that Studio C is where like Sabbath Heaven and Hell was recorded and 
Fleetwood Mac rumors, and on and on. And then we mixed in Studio A, which had an SSL board. And uh, it was it, man, it was just it was just really the best of everything that that I had in my mind for production. And and I I, I have this belief that is important to me whether say i'm putting out an album or writing a novel i i want everything to be the best quality it, it can be from the you know the production to the pages whatever right so that's i knew i would get sonically the best sounding album possible out of doing doing the earth burner album at criteria and take that and Let's face it, take that history I just rattled off. You know, what those names I dropped, those band names I dropped, that's they're just tip of the iceberg. I mean, if you Google criteria and see the list of artists that an album's done there, it'll blow your mind. It's like there's not any studios, not may, maybe a couple more that are still around, like of that legendary status, you know, and that to me as a nerd a music nerd <laughs> is this kind of like a bonus like we recorded there that's pretty cool and we just did a had a clip come out last week for earth burner it's on our youtube channel about recording there and i'm if you see me talking to trevor fletcher from criteria and all right i mentioned all those legendary albums and we get into some of the production and stuff of our album but i keep in that clip, I keep going, hey, would you say in Criteria history, we recorded the heaviest album ever at Criteria? And Trevor's like, yeah, yeah, you did. You did. It's uh, it's a benchmark. <laughs> it just makes me laugh, you know. Yeah. If you learn anything talking to me, Adrian, one I'll talk your ear off. So, <laughs> but you get a hell of an interview out of me because I'll tell you everything. But I just circling back to why we recorded there was it was really convenient because it's not far, criteria wasn't far from my house. And it also, again, I strive, I wanted to really have the best production. And that place gave me everything I needed. So I was really lucky. If, say, I lived in a different state, I probably would still record at a, you know, go to a really world-class studio or something, it, maybe even in Chicago. Chicago's got great studios, you know what I mean? Like, if I was stuck in Illinois and I didn't have the luxury of escaping winter being in Florida and didn't know criteria, I'd still go to the best studio possible to have the best produced album. But it just so happened... Boom. Earth Burner came back into my life. I had a full lineup. I had been sitting on songs and I'm like, I'm not going to waste any time anymore. We're doing an album. And within a week or two, I booked a time at Criteria, had the best engineers, the best crew, and we did it. By the way, I wanted to tell you one other thing in case you didn't know or you're whoever's you know listening to Dreams of Consciousness. I want to tell you this. One Another cool thing that came out of that Criteria the mixing session in Studio A. In Studio A, while we're mixing digitally on Pro Tools, here comes Trevor, the guy I told you about, general manager, VP of Criteria. And he goes, you know what? I got an idea for you guys. You know, while you're mixing down off Pro Tools, you could also mix down to analog at the same time. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, look, man, we've been around forever. We still have the stable of vintage reel to reel tape machines. And I'm like, wow, well, that's really cool. But my, I had a, my question to him was, Hey, do they, they make tape? Yeah. They still make tape, analog tape. And he's like, uh, yeah, yeah. And we got it. And then I go, well, shit, let's do it. So pulled out reel to reel with, I can't remember if it was one or two inch tape, whatever it was, it, you know, legit analog tape. So we mixed down digitally, and then we mixed down to, to analog. And what we got is two, we got permanent dawn, but you got two different mixes. So, for example, when you get the CD, you're just getting the digital version of permanent dawn. 
But for vinyl and cassette, which labels are making cassettes again, which is really crazy to me, side A of the tape and the vinyl, the whole album is on one side. And I got that idea from Slayer's Brain and Blood when I was a teenager. I had I have a cassette right here as I'm talking to you, doing this interview. In my hands, I'm holding my original Slayer Rain and Blood cassette. And that album at the time was under 30 minutes. It was like 28 minutes. So they the label Def Jam Records put Slayer's Rain and Blood on the whole album on side A and side B. So I'm like, let's put the digital side on side A, permanent dawn, and we'll call side A digital dawn. And on side B, that'll be permanent dawn analog dawn and so what we're giving fans whoever buys the vinyl or the cassette you're getting the whole album on each side but you're getting a digital mix and an analog mix and what's cool about it to people that have listened to it and given me feedback they're like you know that digital side is really razor sharp and will take your head right off and you know blow your mind and then when we listen to the analog side same thing we get a heavy duty pummeling but there's almost a warmer and punchier vibe to the analog side that's the feedback i get i kind of agree with that too there's definitely something to say about you know those two mixes but that was an unexpected surprise and something that came out of mixing that criteria and i don't know if that would have happened anywhere else because i mean you know if you're you record in a pro tool studio i don't know if I, i've never been in any studio that has a stable of like really old but like top of the line you know maintained top of the line ma maintenance you know like working real the real machines it's like pulling out like a 1960 Cadillac that's like in pristine condition, you know, and you get behind the wheel and drive it. That's what that tape machine was like. And it, so it, it just really cool. It was like a really cool bonus that came out of this album. So this album is full of all kinds of surprises, actually thinking about, you know, talking about Mitch Harris and Ross Dolan guest vocals and how we came together and said, Earthburner's here, we got to line up, let's record an album and we go in the studio. And then, boom, we got two different versions of the album and one, you know, on one vinyl and one cassette, things like that. But anyway, again, I digress, but want to throw that in there since you asked why criteria, how the process happened, that's kind of how it all came together. And the end result was really just really cool. And again, just stuff i didn't see coming you know what i mean adrian yeah how do you describe the difference between the analog version and the, the digital version is the analog version warmer yeah yep just like kind of like the feedback i i just explained it's like the digital side is definitely uh, like i use the term razor sharp like it's really in your face the clarity is, I don't know. I, I'd say like the clarity on a sonic level is just super loud. It's it's really well done. Mastering has a lot to do with that too. Uh, you know, the guy who mastered it, Mike Fuller, did a great job. But it's, it's just sharper. It's a sharper, crisper kind of like sonic assault. And then... You said it perfectly. Side B, the analog side, that's definitely warmer. And some say it's even got feels punchier, you know, where it's not, not that it's not crisp or anything, but it is, it is warmer than the, than side A, the digital side. It's got a warmer, punchier vibe, still, you know, pummeling still a sonic assault but there is it it really says something about how special i think analog tape is when you think about it, it i'll give you one other thing real quick the first two broken hope 
albums were done digitally on eight mil, like this eight millimeter digital tape. And at the time, it was a sophisticated, advanced technology called the Akai ADAM system. And the studio we recorded at had that. And if like you look on Wikipedia, it'll say Broken Hope were the first digital death metal band because we were the first death metal band to use that technology at a studio. And that was in Gurney, Illinois. And then when we did our third, fourth, and fifth albums, we did those on two-inch analog tape and starting with Repulsive Conception. And I remember hearing the mix on, on that, and I'm like, I love our first two albums, and I thought production was great. But my first impression on it, uh, you know, my mind's drifting back to 1995 when it came out, and I'm like, that has a real warmth to it. So when you talk about hearing an album, but, you know, whatever it is, Broken Hope or Earthburner or whoever, and you do the, you know, like, like a, I don't know, what, what we call the Pepsi challenge, you know, to side by side comparison. But with that Earthburner album, you, you, you can't, you said it, you said it best, man, warmth. There's a warmth there. That's the only way I can explain it. Warmth. And again, other people will say, oh, it's warm and it's punchier, you know, and that's, I just, I think that says a lot about, about analog. And then side A, you know, digital side is just relentless. And again, I, I liken it to the best way to describe it to my ears is just razor sharp. And just, again, I, keep talking about cleaving heads off and decapitating people sonically, but that's kind of like the impression I get when I, when I hear both. So I, I think it's cool. You know, we can offer both to, to, to listeners and fans in one shot if they get the vinyl and cassette. So just something a little extra special. And I don't know. I don't know anyone doing that kind of thing in this day and age, you know, just right place, right time. And, you know, we were able to squeeze the album on both sides too. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to have well, a four four vinyl set album or double CDs or two different cassettes or something. You know, we were able to pull it off. So yeah, just something really cool, man. Don't shake those 
Did Scott Creekmore handle the the in studio recording, or was that uh, an engineer at, at Criteria, an in house engineer? Yeah, that was that was Scott Creekmore. Okay. And Scott Scott built my home studio. Him, he's one of my oldest friends actually on the planet. We've known each other since we were like seventeen, and he became this great studio guy, but not so much in the early 90s we always had brian griffin our lead guitar player he produced like the first five broken hope albums and was a studio engineer so he brian he worked his ass off on every album he'd engineer track you know record mix produce everything and then like the last two broken hope albums we had scott was part of home of disease and then a little bit but then mutilated and assimilated in 2017 scott engineered mixed produced that with me pretty much and then i brought him in on earthburner and he engineered and mixed the whole earthburner album and then my buddy tommy mcwilliams produced the album with me so tommy produced you know we co-produced it together and tommy is a uh like a long time studio drummer and engineer. So he he's he's got some great skills, absolutely amazing skills and really, really great like just music history alone. I mean he's I think he toured with everyone from Steve Harris of Myron Maiden's daughter daughter's band Lauren Harris back in the day to drumming for like Ricky Martin and doing, <laughs> doing drums for like, you know, Aerosmith and stuff when, when, when they, when their drummer was having problems or something in the studio, but Tommy, his wisdom, his skills and everything, I brought him in to help me get things done in the studio. Not, not, not quite engineering, you know, that, that was Scott and Scott mixed and stuff, but Tommy really helped coordinate a lot of things with miking and the whole process and you know getting the best production possible again from the neve board where we track to the ssl board mixing just making sure we had the right personnel and and then he oversaw all the mastering with mike fuller who mastered it so that's kind of the crew it was like scott creekmore tommy and me as far as production if you will yeah you've you've worked a lot with scott Besides your friendship with him, what did you like about working with him? And what did you want him to bring to the sound of Permanent Dawn? Scott, one, thanks for asking that question, man, because no one's asked me about Scott at all. You're the first person in all the press I've been doing for Earthburner to ask about Scott. Scott's like a vital part of my recording life in a big way. You know, I mentioned he built my home studio, so... In this interview, you know, I talk about Neve boards and SSL boards and microphones and stuff, but I'll straight up tell you, I, I'd be like a name dropping poser acting like I was a studio guru. I am not. I need Scott to get, he had the, I had him just like in my, in my home studio, he helped me pick out all the gear that I have all my preamps, microphones, Pro Tools, updating it, and had to give me lessons on Pro Tools. You know, when you ask, oh, do you record riffs on, on Pro Tools? I'm like, yeah, I, I multi-track different guitars, blah, blah, blah. I couldn't do it without Scott. He taught me everything I know. But Scott also, it's worth mentioning, he has legit Earthburner history, because at one point he was going to do vocals back in 2001, 2002 for Earthburner. And like that first incarnation. But uh, anyway, that's... He, uh, he played with Broken Hope for a little while as well, right? Yeah. When our fifth album came out, our singer Joe quit. And we were getting ready to go on tour. And, and Joe quit right when we were getting ready to leave that week and put put us in a bad spot. And I, I'm, I'm kind of like the guy, who, you know, the show must go on. So we got, we got Scott to fill in on vocals. He did a great job. And then it was at that time... 
back then, 2000, uh, or yeah, 2000 through 2002, during that album cycle, Scott was always on vocals, but he was also starting to become a studio engineer and built his own home studio. So the first Earthburner demos I did were at his studio. And then over the years, Scott just got better and better and better with engineering and everything. And so the best parts about Scott are his skills, like, you know, I talk about Tommy's skills and wisdom. Well, Scott's skills as an engineer and mixing in his ears, that guy's top of the line. And of course, for any band recording, you, you know, you, you want someone that knows what they're doing and is going to get you the best results. But the other bonus for me is a, a personal level. He's one of my best friends. We've known each other since we were 17. So when you're in a studio working all those hours, man, tracking, you know, <laughs> mixing, recording, to have one of your best friends with you along for, along for the ride, making this album, this art you're creating. That's just another bonus for me too. You know, that was like made the, the studio time, which can be boring as hell for anyone who knows it takes a long time. And, a lot of hours having someone you're close with and has the same sense of humor as you and that bond and friendship i mean that's really special you know and for me that was very special so you, you take all that put it in a box with a big bow on it and that's like scott and me just having a great time making the album and you can't put a price on that for me that was that was a really cool experience you know having scott at my side and just doing the surf burner album given that world downfall is was such a big influence on earth burner and you've got a couple other ogs like mitch and ross on the album did you want the sound of the album to be a little bit classic a little bit more old school i wanted like i i wanted but i think the way i put it is the way i approach the music is old school because you know i i like the bands that i was inspired by are still my favorite bands and albums to listen to i'm not drawing inspiration broken hope or earth burner from anything new i still for whatever reason and it's not that i don't appreciate newer bands by any means you know or they don't have any impact on me there are plenty that do but the bands that motivated me and inspired my my riffing if you will go back to you know the the 80s and early 1991 you know and again it's like i'll give you examples aside from telling you for the millionth time that terrorizer world downfall he had a huge impact on me. Morbid Angel, Altars of Madness, Carcass, Symphonies of Sickness, Obituary, Slowly We Rot, for example. There's others, but it, those albums had such an impact on me and it, it, it inspired me and it influenced me that that inspiration has carried me from the late 80s to 2024. So, to that end, there is absolutely what you're saying or uh, asking is I do have an old school approach to the way I write, you know, those, you know, I get, I like to think I got my own style, my own sound, but, you know, I don't want to sound like anybody else, but I do want to harness that friggin' energy, bro. You know, like, uh, OSDM or old grind, if you will. So there's that part of, of my songwriting and what I do. But my, I will say I have a quote unquote mission with delivering a product that's sonically superior to, to anything. I've done before. And I'll tell you what, what I, where my head is on that. And it, it's like this, you know, like if you have, 
if you ever look back over the last 30 years, there's when it comes to grind, even black metal, other other grind bands and crust bands, I I know there's a desire from bands of your in those genres that really aim for a lo-fi crusty kind of production so and that's great and i just told you like i love symphony symphonies of sickness for example the production on that isn't so great slowly we rock was done on an eight track studio you know was back in the day and but the impact was still there but when it comes to me yes i have an old school approach to writing and my you know my my style is is in that in that vein from those bands that i mentioned but i have this belief i don't care if you're a grindcore band uh, for me for me personally i'm in a grindcore band i don't adhere or care about being so crusty and lo-fi that i'm delivering an album that doesn't sound good so so again like when i'm putting out music it's all about quality and and part of that is that i i have said in interviews and to friends and people that an album is forever that's really what i believe like you know band of oh, bands right adrian dreams of consciousness listeners you've heard of bands re-recording albums that were classic and it's like you didn't have to do that i would never do that i just feel that if it, an album is eternal you're not gonna sure you could remaster it like we're remastering all the first five broken hope albums and metal blades putting them out next year with bonus tracks and stuff but we'd never i would never re-record an album so what my point is when an album comes out by me i want it to be the best sounding album period because that is going to be eternal that album is out there forever and i'm never going to touch it again like re-record something or whatever that's it so i i think i owe it to whoever buys that album that they pick it up and whether you're where if it's in your car with headphones any stereo you're going to be blown away by the production and having top quality production and recording at criteria studios that didn't like dilute or take away any of the ferociousness intensity heaviness brutality of Earthburner. quite the opposite you're hearing everything in very special nuanced ways because the production and the mastering we aimed high and and you're getting a full audio assault that we did our best to deliver so does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah yeah so bottom line long with the jeremy bending your ear is <laughs> old school writing approach meets modern studio high quality production boom that's what you got with uh earth burners permanent dawn very cool so by the time people hear this episode or watch it on YouTube, Permanent Dawn will be out through M Theory Audio. Jeremy, please tell everyone how they can order the album. What's the best way to get it? Okay, the best way to get it is there's the M Theory Audio record label website. And that that's that's the website where you can actually get like the cassette tapes I was talking about, because those aren't distributed everywhere and they're lit very limited quantities so if you can get them get them now we also have a, a link tree for earth burner so uh if anyone that uses link tree it's basically lnk.to forward slash earth burner and then you get the official store you get spotify bandcamp plastic head apple youtube and all this stuff and m theory audio is m dash theory audio.com to get everything and as far as earth burner if you want to find us follow us listen to singles see snippets of us in the studio that are coming up we we documented the whole recording of the album you can check that stuff out 
at Instagram at Earthburner Grind. Twitter, I believe, is Earthburner 666. And then there's Earthburner Official on Facebook. And then we do have an Earthburner YouTube channel with a bunch of videos and stuff. I just don't know the link, but just Google Earthburner or go to YouTube uh, and you'll find it. We got some special stuff there. We also have earthburner.com. Do you want to say anything about the two different versions of the vinyl that M Theory Audio put out? Oh, yep, absolutely. So for anyone picking up the vinyl, we have actually two editions of the vinyl. In the USA, North America, we have a colored vinyl we call Smoked Cadaver, which is like a smoky colored vinyl. Side A is a digital mix side. Side B is an analog mix. Side A we call Digital Dawn. Side B we call Analog Dawn. Same with the cassette tapes, side A and B. One side is digital, side A. One side is analog, side B. For Europe, on the vinyl side, we have orange vinyl that we call Orange Downfall. And that's our little nod to Terrorizer's World Downfall. <laughs> orange Downfall. <laughs> and that's available. Uh, that's a European exclusive. So uh, we got those two colored vinyls. And again, with the vinyl and cassette, you get a, a digital side mix, side A, and an analog mix, side B, for vinyl and cassette. Pretty cool stuff. Are there any plans to bring Earthburner on the road in 2025? I'm hoping so. We've got two festivals coming up, one in Chicago called Heavy Chicago, then Decibel Metal and Beer Festival in Denver, Colorado, here in the States, December 7th. And uh, other than that, just been talking to people about tours, but nothing confirmed yet. But I got a feeling that once this album comes out, which is coming out soon, November 8th, worldwide. Um, I think things will really start happening. So I, I anticipate Earthburner will have a lot more visibility on the road in 2025. We just were patiently waiting to confirm and make it happen. Very cool. And do you want to say anything about the, the new material that you're writing? What can people expect from the next Earthburner album? Oh, the new stuff that we're writing, I will... I uh, I think the longest song on our Permanent Dawn album is about two minutes, 45 seconds. And I did write <laughs> one of my new songs is maybe close to three minutes. I can tell you that much. We'll see if that changes. And then we got another song like oh, that's, you know, like a like a minute long. We only got a couple of a couple of songs, but they're they're coming along really well. And I will say you can expect what you hear on Permanent Dawn, you know, as far as ferocity, heaviness, uh, aggressiveness. But I think these songs are actually that we're writing are even faster than the first album. So that's that's about all I can tell you. But I can tell you we probably will have a full album written by uh, March or April if we keep up at it. Very cool. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Adrian, thanks for the interview, man. Appreciate you having me.